Hello and welcome along to the On The Whistle podcast. This is such a special edition. I'm recording from Chicago in my in-law's basement. Would you believe it? For those of you who don't know the United States, a lot of houses have two or three floors, including a basement. For those of us who live in London, this would be the equivalent of a lovely two-bed apartment. Um, joining me today is uh, Fredoz Munda from Cape Town. Fredoz, so good to have our women's editor at large joining us. There's a lot for us to unpack as the World Cup uh, has come to a close. Yes, yeah, Zayl, it's so lovely to be on. I'm not in a basement. I am in <laughs> the Cape Town evening. I've got electricity and I've managed to light up my face. So this is a, a great day here in Southern Africa. Uh, I have a few withdrawal symptoms, I must say. It's been been kind of blue sure. after the Women's World Cup ended. We had such a great Sunday. We made some Spanish omelette and had some <laughs> English muffins. And I love oh, it was that. just the best day. And uh, yeah, I'm feeling a little bit sad that it's over. So I'm glad that sure. I got someone to talk to. Well, I'm glad you got in the theme of it. I sat there with Cheerios and a baby on my shoulder at about <laughs> five or six in the morning to, to take it all in. And it wouldn't be a podcast from the U.S. without some root beer. This is Spreakers. For those of you who don't know, root beer is a lovely um, soda that they have in the United States and possibly in your part of the world. It's non-alcoholic, which means anyone and everyone can avoid it. And it doesn't have any caffeine so that you might love or hate for those. So is it good? What does it taste like? It's like a South African cream soda, but not... And it's got this beautiful, like, aftertaste. It's sort of, it's got a soda taste, but it's not as strong as Coke or Pepsi. Okay, sounds interesting. And I think it's because it's made from lovely honey, which I'm led to oh. believe is from Wisconsin, which is where my in-laws live. So, wow. for those, enough talk about Rupia. We have a lot to dig our teeth into. And for those of you listening out there, please don't forget to find us at our social media accounts, um, OTW underscore podcast if you're looking on Twitter and Instagram. And of course, please watch our podcast at uh, the On The Whistle podcast um, uh, link and handle on YouTube. And of course, you can find us exactly the same name on Facebook. Join the discussion on your platform of preference. And of course, if you're listening on Spotify, Apple, um, whatever podcast platform is your preference, do leave a rating, do leave a review. We love to hear from you. And right at the end of the show, I'll be reading a few of our selected comments out. But for those, you mentioned it earlier, an absolutely amazing World Cup. We saw Spain, in my opinion, technically the best team. While they might not have selected their best team because of conflicts within Spain with the coach, with the federation, still a cut above everybody else. Yes, I know they did um, lose to Japan in the group stages. Uh, But the Spanish team really set the benchmark beating an England team who I think were a little lucky and had a soft draw in making it to the finals. But what we want to focus in on in our podcast, because we are Africa's biggest bri, is the African teams. And there has been a lot of movement in the FIFA rankings post this tournament. Yeah, there really has been. And it's Spain's opponent, Zambia, who made the biggest move. They moved up 14 places, so they're up from 77 to 58. And I'm quite pleased to see them move. I think Nigeria, and and you mentioned them as, you mentioned England's soft draw. And I think a lot of us feel that Nigeria could have beaten England, not just the penalty shootout. They had so many chances in regular time, in extra time. They they were all over England and, and Nigeria are now pushing for that top 30. They've moved from 40 to 32. So hopefully they're, they're going to enter kind of the big time in the next couple of years. Morocco, they've moved up to 72 to 58. They've moved 14 places. And our beloved Banyana Banyana, they're into the top 50. They've moved up from 54 to 45. And I guess these big moves, you know, we're talking about eight, nine, 14 places. Uh, It's a really nice reflection of how well Africa did at the tournament. We had three teams qualify for the round of 16, and we reflected on that in our previous pod. And just how much it's shown the growth of the game. You know, one of my worries in football is that the global south might be getting left behind because the global north is developing and professionalizing Mm -hmm. so quickly but the results from the rankings and the results of the tournament sort of show us that the global south is is keeping pace and uh, so come 2027 uh, we're going to have a semi-finalist we're going to have a finalist and hell maybe we'll even have a winner 
<laughs> Listen, I think it was Patrice Mutsepe who said Africa's best chance of winning a World Cup might be a women's team. So I think there's quite a few people who share that, that train of thought. And, you know, I still remember the Banyana game against uh, Holland and the way um, South Africa set up. It potentially wasn't the best team with injuries and, and other issues besotting the team. But Katlana was running, you know, circles around those Dutch defenders. It was hard to believe that this was the creme de la creme of Europe um, and a 2 0 victory. But I felt like Banyana could have taken that game. Um, but listen, we've spoken about the rankings and the movers and the shakers, but how has the success on the field translated often? Yeah, I guess that that's really going to be the test of the legacy of this World Cup is, is what's going to happen now that the tournament is over and that there's got to be a period of reflection and also a period of growth. So the first way that, that it's impacting is, is money. And we know that FIFA promised big amounts to players and we've seen some of the money delivered. Nigeria each received 10,000 US dollars from their government and they were very grateful for it. We saw some articles of them thanking the government for valuing them, for giving them this financial reward. And I, I almost feel a bit awkward about that. You know, you, you don't see men's teams thanking people for a little bit of extra cash on the side because they feel that they deserve it. And Nigeria, certainly the way that they played in this tournament and the shenanigans, the, the absolute shenanigans they've had off the field, the issues with the coach and the football federation, they deserve every one of those $10,000 that they've got each. And, and that's fabulous for them. And I think the other place where this tournament will leave a real legacy is Morocco. So I saw a lot of media around young Moroccan girls watching football in public places, in restaurants, drinking their mint tea mm -hmm. with their male cousins and brothers. And, and the men were kind of saying, we'd never really watched women's football before. Mm -hmm. And the girls were saying, well, neither had we. But now, wow, look at us. I mean, of course, the Moroccan men's team was sensational at last year's World Cup. Now they've got a women's team to support as well. And their legacy mm -hmm. is, is a cultural legacy. It's a legacy of showing young women from the Islamic world that, and, and from the Arab world, you know, they don't have to be Muslim women, that uh, we can do it. We can, and I say we, because sure. as I mentioned, that's my legacy too. I can't do it. I think I'm, I'm too old for that now, but uh, <laughs> you know, these girls can do it. And then just as a last kind of takeaway, I think we're back down to earth here in South Africa. So next week on the pond, we're going to have uh, Kaylin Swart, who's the Banyana Banyana yeah, goalkeeper. I'm I'm revved um, up and looking forward to that. Yeah. Give us a teaser. What can we expect? Yeah, well, she spoke about this come down. You know, she said two weeks ago, I was flying to Sydney on an airplane. And this weekend, I'm taking a bus to Limpopo to play in the league. And I'm going to play the same day that I'm on that bus. And that's quite a, a realization. She's returned to her day job as a sports coach at a school. Uh, she, she's very, very grateful for the experiences. And she absolutely loved the World Cup. And she took so much from it. But this is the, the thing she's come back to is a league that is not professional, uh, a league mm. where players are training with full-time jobs, traveling on the same day as game day because there's no money for them to stay overnight, not getting adequate locker room facilities, and they're still trying to be professional footballers. So for me, that's the big takeaway is what happens to these players and these women. I think that's a pertinent question because something that I've been wondering about is that there are incredible opportunities for commercial partners in South Africa to get behind women's football or girls' football in whatever capacity. And how much pressure is there now for professional women's league to come into effect in the country? Yeah, massive. Absolutely massive. And the pressure is coming from the top. The pressure is coming from the South African government and the sports minister, newly appointed, came into office this year, Zizi Kodwa, who has been absolutely scathing on SAFA and the way that they've handled this World Cup. He was at a cricket event this week. You all know my, my day job as a cricket writer. And Cricket South Africa launched a professional domestic women's league. They're the first sporting body in the country to professionalize a women's domestic sport. And I, I want to be excited, but I just want to contextualize here. The women in that league are going to be earning as much as the highest paid men in the second division. So it's, yes, it's professional, but like, let's just say, even though cricket have done it, they've only sort of like half kind of done it and they're earning some money, but it's not huge money. Anyway, at this event, Zizi Kodwa took the opportunity to have a full go at Safa, to say that a professional league is an absolute must, to say that they failed in their leadership 
when they did not support and provide Banyana Banyana with adequate facilities before the World Cup, you remember they boycotted that warm-up match against Botswana because the field they thought was substandard. It also wasn't used by PSL teams. And Zizi Kodwa said Safa absolutely failed as leaders. What happened in that build-up must never be repeated. And he has told them that by 2027, and hopefully before, if they want to host the World Cup, they need to professionalize that league. So there's pressure from the top. All the players are asking for a professional league. There's not one of them who will say they're happy to keep up jobs as coaches or administrators or you know other kinds of part-time work. They want to play football professionally. And now it's up to the fans to demand the same. And then, as you mentioned, Zane, you can't do this without money. So we know mm-hmm. that Sassol have been longtime supporters of the women's game in this country. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know that there are other partners involved. Hollywood Betts sponsors the the league at the moment, the Women's League in South Africa. Mm. And Patrice Motsepe owns one of the teams, right? So it's not like there's not money around what's going on, but it's now for that money to to really show us what it can do. And, and there's huge press on Safa. Mm. Look at Morocco, two-tier professional league, and look at them, they're flying. And there's nothing we would love to see more than a professional league in this country. Well, I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit on that because Morocco does have uh, two pro tiers of football and we've seen that come into effect and how it has played its role in improving football in the country. Um, You have Morocco, who are WAFCON finalists last year. You have Morocco, who made the knockout rounds. So clearly we see a link between professional leagues and the success of national leagues. But maybe give us a bit more... um, context around Morocco and what they're doing. Yeah, so then that, that's the obvious thing, right? I mean, if you put money in in place and, and if the money is used correctly, I think that that is also part of it because we know that one of the unfortunate happenings uh, on the continent is, is that there is often a lot of corruption. And, you know, we've seen kind of warning signs from the Nigerian media as well, where there are also calls to professionalize the league and people there saying, well, please spend some money, but also please make sure you actually spend it on the right things. But if you put that money there and you put it there correctly, the results will will have to logically follow. And so what Morocco have done is they've built a lot of stadia, including a really good high performance center. And that is for the men and the women. And they've put a lot of money in 2020. They put a huge amount of money into the women's game. So they came up with this two-tier professional league. The big clubs are still the big clubs. So as far are the ones that are producing most of the players. And I suppose you'll find that anywhere in the world. But they've created an environment where their domestic players want to play in Morocco. They're not looking for deals overseas because they don't need them because they're earning enough at home. They're getting huge numbers of support. They're getting a lot of support from the people who matter, the sports ministry, the people in the uh, royal household, which I suppose is important in some countries and and a country like theirs, it is quite important. And the, the access to great facilities is also what's helping them. They've also got a coach at the national level who's done it before and who's coached very successful teams, including Leon, that have won the Champions League. So, you know, it's yep. all that kind of stuff that that makes a team successful. And I think that's what not just South Africa, Zambia and Nigeria, who are our representatives this mm-hmm. time around, but, you know, the, the rest of the countries on the continent. So we know West Africa's got rich footballing talent. Botswana, who are just next door mm-hmm. and sort of, you know, very close to us, also have a good development program. And there's nothing stopping these countries besides money and besides will to to really get going and and we've we've got an AFCON next year to you know showcase the skills and to sure. showcase some development but for me that 2027 World Cup has to be a, a real statement from Africa and from other parts of the global south South America to to say you know what we're here to play sure and we've spoken about players we've spoken about the importance of leagues but given um, what a successful World Cup Desiree Ellis had. Um, do we see her staying on with the national team, Banyana Banyana, or could there be an opportunity overseas? Yeah, this is the question. And uh, I, I think a lot of people will ask, you know, what, what Desiree feels she has left to achieve with South Africa because she's won an AFCON, which is phenomenal and something that she really wanted to do. She's taken them further than any other coach at a World Cup. So, of course, she'd love to win a World Cup. But, you know, that that will take another four years. And I think that'll be a long time to stay as a national coach. So, you know, whether she wants to go and defend that AFCON title next year will maybe play a role in it. But I also think, given what happened before the World Cup, 
And given that Desiree Ellis was the person who had to take a very, very experimental banana banana side out to play against Botswana and they got thumped 5-0 and she had to do that because it was on the instruction of her bosses. Maybe she's not all too happy with the way that Safa are going. And she definitely, there are a lot of talk of the interest that she's attracted from other African countries, which of course, you know, that's close to home and, and probably a project she'd love to do. But why not a European gig for Desiree Ellis? We've seen Serena Wiegman, and, and we can talk about the merits of her coaching uh, maybe on another podcast. <laughs> but, you know, she's had huge success in Europe. So why should Desiree not enjoy something of the same? She's an excellent tactician. Sometimes we criticized her team selections, and Kaylin Swart was one of those that we thought about. But uh, she was proved right, and and really she's done a, a lot of good with this Banyana Banyana team. So I understand that she's meeting with Safa in the next month to talk about her future. Sure. Uh, before that, she's going to be on a panel discussion with me at the Open Book Literature Festival. So maybe I'm going to toss a little question in there and, and ask her what she's thinking. Uh, she's just an absolute legend and, and she's achieved oh. so much with this team that I, I think, I know she's 60, but, uh, you know, 60 is a new 40, right? Sure. And in coaching terms, that's great experience and also a lot of great energy that could be there, in my opinion. Um, looking ahead to 2027, we know that uh, Safa is hoping to host the World Cup. Uh, Banyana Banyana have hopefully bolstered that bid. What is the latest then? Yeah, so it's all systems go, really, in that there was a bid workshop at the World Cup and the interested countries were taken through their paces. Now it's to put together the final bid, which must be submitted in December before the decision will be made in May next year. So SAFA have already identified their 10 stadiums, pretty much the 10 that we we know about that were there for the 2010 World Cup. Some of them do need some sprucing up, particularly Moses Mabida down in Durban, which has really just suffered from a lot of neglect. And then of course, there's the smaller ones um, in, in Limpopo and in Pumalanga, which also will probably need a little bit of sprucing up. It has been 13 years, and by 2027, it will be 17 years. But Safa, I think, have put together a really strong commission, and uh, that was the commission that represented them at the World Cup. It's, of course, Danny O'Dan, who secured the 2010 World Cup. Then their CEO, Lydia Monia Pau, who's you know in a historic position as the first woman there. They have a bid committee chair, Tumid Lamini, and then they've got a head of women's football, which I think is quite interesting. It's a lady called Romani Pinnock, who's got a lot of experience in football. She's a founding director of the Cape Town Badgers Club, but also experience outside of football in that she was the COO of the Desmond and Leah Tutu Foundation. So mm -hmm. she obviously knows a lot about managing projects, which is really what a World Cup is, a huge project. The other thing that I think will give South Africa the edge, and I'm speaking just as an optimist who really wants to cover another World Cup. Sure. Um, is that Africa did really well and South Africa did really well. And so you know that putting the World Cup in this country gives you a host that can hold their status as host. So the other countries that are bidding are the USA and Mexico. And of course, Mexico were not at this World Cup. Then we've got uh, the joint bid, Belgium, Argentina, uh, Argentina, Belgium, Austria, and uh, is it the Netherlands or Germany? So neither Belgium nor Austria were at this World Cup. So you wonder, you know, does does FIFA want to give out that many sort of free passes, so to speak? And then the Brazilian bid, which I think could be strong despite Brazil's underperformance at the World Cup. But their organization around 2014 uh, was really poor and, and FIFA was said to be quite unhappy with the way that tournament went. So I think South Africa... We have a lot of problems. The lights don't always stay on. I mean, there's a range of things that could go wrong, but they don't. At World Cups, things do not go wrong here. We've hosted an amazing Cricket World Cup this year. 2010 was a vibe. You were there. You know what that was like. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, we, we, we really know how to host a tournament, and, and I hope that the powers that be know that. But, you know, despite me punting my own country here, I also want to talk about the social legacy because... You know, what you do when you bring a global tournament here is, is you show people the possibility of what, what can be achieved. And th there are lots of young girls in this country who still need to see that it is possible to play professional football because there is no professional football league, so there better be one by then, and to become really respected in what is considered still, I suppose, a masculine patriarchal sport. So sure. why not? Why, why not give them the opportunity to see what's possible, to have 
tons of, of social clinics. You know, when the 2010 World Cup was held here, Sporting Chance did a street football tournament. It's still running. I saw them just the other day, actually. And, sure. and they still have street football clinics going. Uh, people need to believe that sport can change their lives. And in Africa, then you've said it, you know, our greatest ambassadors are not our politicians. <laughs> they are not, you know, to some extent, our musicians and our artists. But our greatest ambassadors are sure. our footballers. And women deserve to be on that on that list, too. Sure. And listen, there's certainly going to be um, a wave of steam ahead of that one. And we'll wait to see where, where it lands. But like you say, South Africa has a track record of delivering these big events. So certainly, um, I think, um, as FIFA looks to grow the sport and ensure they're servicing all the continents, if not within the next four years, perhaps um, sooner than that, or, or not sooner than that, not so long after that. Um, yeah, not, not longer than that. We'll be too old. We're not going to be able to. <laughs> not, not after that. Never too old. <laughs> um, I'm really going to go. Um, before we go, um, it would be remiss without talking about the Super Falcons. Uh, their forward, uh, Francisca Ordega, is wanting to have kids. Um, what could that mean for a career? And is it even right for me to even say that should be the discussion around this, right? Yeah, I found the media around that quite interesting because yeah. the the... The headlines were sort of thinking of having a baby in the next four years because she says, not all I want to do is be a footballer. And it was sort mm -hmm. of like this mutually exclusive conversation. Like if she has a baby, then that's it. She's done. Sure. And uh, you've got two babies and uh, <laughs> your your wife is, is not done with her, with her career. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're talking about somebody who's 29 years old, who even if she has a baby tomorrow, which would of course not be possible, uh, she would come back and be playing by the age of 30 or 31. And we've seen so many players come back. And, and I want to mention Serena Williams as one. But in the in the South African women's netball team, for example, pretty much half the team were mothers. And, and that's a sport with a lot of mothers playing there. Uh, Bisma Marouf, the Pakistan cricket captain, uh, became a mother. And she brought her child with her to the women's mm. team along with her mother as the child minder. So it's definitely possible. And what's so interesting about this is, and, and this is why I say I feel like the Global South really needs to fight very tough battles because in the Global North, there's already conversation around maternity leave for professional sports sure. people. We're not having those conversations. We're just like, oh, if you have a baby, you're done, done, which I don't think is, is fair on people who can and have proven themselves to be able to juggle multiple things. I mean, a lot of them are juggling jobs with football. So why not, you know, job, baby and football? I mean, that might be a bit tough. Sure. But it's it's just interesting the way that was covered. And and it's good, it's good to me that we're having these discussions, that African football is starting to talk about the big issues, the social issues, you know, what does it mean for players if they want to develop their lives mm -hmm. in other ways? But I don't want our discussion to be myopic. You know, we can be many things at the same time. And there's no reason why people can't be mothers and, and professional sports people and you know, I wish her all the best as she embarks on her journey to start a family, but she's a great footballer and she put in some epic performances at this World Cup. And so there's no reason that she can't come back. Absolutely. So articulately and well-spoken, I'm going to throw one more at you for those before the pod ends. And, um, you know, we're a podcast that we focus on African football. That's our remit. That's what we like doing. But it would be, you know, completely tone deaf to the discussion that we're having in women's football without referencing what happened at the World Cup final. Obviously, Spain won. The players went on stage to accept their medals, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, lift the trophy. Um, and they were congratulated by an overzealous president in uh, Luis Rubiales, who kissed uh, Jenny Humoso, the, the goal scorer at the final, uh, as she was going up on stage. I have to say, even though I was watching it in the early hours in Kenosha, Wisconsin, it looked very awkward. It didn't look appropriate. I remember making mention of that to my father-in-law at the time. Um, yeah, what's the latest on the situation? And um, how did you read it from, from where you were? And now that you've had the chance to digest it too. Yeah, I must say, Zane, my initial reaction, especially because a lot of the players were doing the double kiss, which is, uh, you know common in, in parts of Europe uh, was that, oh, they're just kind of doing what you do there. And then, I mean, there was that one, obviously, very obvious kiss on the mouth, which at the time I didn't actually register and think that much of. And then when I saw it kind of blowing up in 
what I'm going to call the Western media, uh, I thought like, oh yeah, this is kind of like how it works, you know, when people have a culture and then other people criticize. And this is before I'd really thought about the fact that he actually it's, kissed it's, her it's, on the it's, mouth. It's, 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 it's so interesting because I remember when the players were going up and he was grabbing a lot of them and hugging yeah. them and lifting them. It just, again, maybe, I don't know, I'm, I'm a guy who likes public displays of affection, but that did feel just like there was a line and he was going over it. And the reason why Hermoso stood out to me is that she almost like her arms went straight. And then I was like, oh, because <laughs> I remember seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. And she said afterwards, I didn't actually like that. Right. So I, for yeah. me, that was where the discussion changed. Because first mm. I was like, OK, maybe it is a cultural thing that we don't understand. And then I was like, OK, she said, I didn't actually like that, which made me think two things. The one is, you know, something can be a cultural thing and people cannot actually like it at the same time. And sure. so maybe then we need to question that. And the second is like, it's good that she's got a platform to say, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And to be heard on that because, uh, you know, other people would have not said anything or, or just been expected to kind of accept it as like a normal thing. And of course the latest is that he's going to be investigated. And I guess that has to be done. Uh, at the same time, yeah. we don't know if the Zambian coach who's been alleged for touching his player's chest is being investigated by FIFA. Sorry, I've just had a cat jump violently <laughs> out of its... Uh, I, don't, I don't know That's what's going luck. on. Like, Yeah, he's alive, so eight to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I mean, I think that an investigation is probably a good thing. And I also yeah. think we need to hear more of the women's voices in it because we want to hear not just from Hermosa herself, but the other players, and perhaps even if there are former players, people involved in administration, you know, what is appropriate? And, and it's for the woman to draw that line yes. and say, this is appropriate and, and this is not. We know that emotions in, in sport make you do some really, really wild things. And we've seen, sure. you know, the pylons and the, I mean, he was also celebrating the final win in quite an absurd way, I suppose. <laughs> um, <laughs> like grabbing his crotch. <laughs> yeah, and, and I mean, I don't think that's a cultural thing, right? We can't, I'm not going to say that. It's like, no. that's just an odd thing to do and, and, and completely inappropriate, especially on a global stage, which I guess brings this, you know, we spoke about it in, in previous pods that women's football has kind of positioned itself and women's sport a, as a vehicle to also discuss a lot of social justice issues, sure. a lot of issues around marginalization. And, and this is a similar issue. This is the issue of what is appropriate conduct in a global setting where people come from so many different places and have so many different ideas of, of what the right thing to do is. We had this discussion in Qatar last year, you know, is it appropriate to sell alcohol? Is it appropriate to have mm. uh, the laws that they had on the LGBTQI plus uh, rights? And, and I just think this discussion is going to go on and it's great. We must always discuss things and, and we must always talk about things and interrogate things because that's why we are journalists. <laughs> well, listen, Always wonderful hearing your perspective for those, particularly your lived experience in this. Um, and for those of you listening out there, let us know all your thoughts. What is the future for African football? What is going to happen with that 2027 bid? And if you ever thought about what's going on in Spain with the saga, please tweet us, send us a voice note, get in touch. We'd love to hear you. And if you've come this far, leave a rating, leave a review. It helps people find the show. For those, thank you for joining. I wish you well in Cape Town. Um, and um, I look forward to your interview with Kaylin Swartz next week. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that uh, the listeners are looking forward to that too. And, you know, I'm just making, I'm just collecting the besties as we go. I had Janine up front, Desiree. I'm, so hopefully, uh, if anybody else would like to be my best friend, On the Whistle is the place <laughs> to do it. <laughs> what a great platform to do it. You take care now. Thank you for those.